Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is the Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people of all ages at all stages of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientation, gender identities, social and economic situations, politics and abilities. We advocate for human rights, and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. In living our mission, we recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River. So we honor the Peoria people in our service as we have been asked to do. And we honor them for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank folks for joining us uh, in person and online. We recognize how precious it is to come together, how important it is to expand our circles of care and connection, so it is good to be here. And if you are new, please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. We have lovely welcoming ushers, and we love all the questions as well. Try us. I'm just saying, try us. And I invite you to stay after the service for visiting in uh, Fellowship Hall for coffee. I mean, take a little walk on the path outside because it is beautiful today. Or stay in uh, Zoom if you're joining us online for a conversation there. I'm going to invite folks to turn your respective devices to worship mode at this time, if that works for you. And, uh, and I want to invite folks into a couple of notes for this morning. This service today is our annual service of remembrance. We take a pause at this fall time of year, at the intersection of so many traditions and harvests and uh, religious practices, to remember and cherish the memory of those who have passed, uh, those who have, were in our lives and are now present in spirit. We just take that moment because we recognize the importance of love and loss and the experience of grief in our lives. Uh, so we offer this time for remembering our beloved dead. And I want to invite you to, uh, the, at the tables we have before us, uh, we have candles and we have spaces. If you happen to bring photos, small mementos, and so on, those are welcome to be added to the table. I hope you received. If you not, we have extra uh, leaves that upon which you can write the name of those who you are remembering. And we add it to the table, and we tend to share uh, those names at the end of the service. There'll be a moment for that. Uh, let's see. And also today, we have uh, a couple of notes. One, this afternoon, uh, we are hosting two Halloween events, one which is um, a trunk or treat, from our local lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, interfaith, uh, interfaith, interfaith, uh, intersex, asexual plus community is hosting a trunk or treat here on uh, here on our property, and we're having an uh, affirming faith communities social gathering for middle school youth and up as well inside. All are welcome. If you haven't had enough Halloween, we have more because we have more. I also want to invite folks. We have an annual process for affirming the social justice projects and commitments that are the main focus of the congregation for a given year. Uh, and we affirm those at our congregational meeting uh, every fall. The congregational meeting is coming up on November 17th. Look for the agenda that will be sent out by email later today. And if you have major projects uh, that might be of interest to the social impact group, uh, please get those in. Talk to Nora Sullivan. You can talk to me. We want to get those in this week so the Social Impact Committee can make recommendations. We have uh, next Sunday, we have a late addition to the schedule. Uh, next Sunday afternoon, uh, 5 p.m. is a discussion opportunity for the Will and Harper documentary on Netflix. 
Uh, this is with Will Farrell and his friend Harper, who uh, they journey together as she is in the new experience of being out as a trans woman and what is that life like for her and their deep friendship that goes along with that. Um, and there'll be soup, there'll be sides to share if you want to bring something and so on, that'd be great. See Tim Harold for more information and for how to watch the soap. Tim has the fabulous shirt on today because he always has a fabulous shirt on, but see him for more about that. And now I'd like to invite us into our service, into our opening hymn, number 389, Gathered Here. We'll be singing it, we'll listen to it once, we'll listen, sing it all together, and we'll sing it in a round in two parts, one side and the other side. All right, please rise in body and spirit. And let me invite Jamie Harold forward for our opening words, please. Gather we now into this space, this time when the wheel turns and the veil shatters. Gather we now to remember, to grieve, to prophesy, to complete our harvests before the long dark comes. Gather we now to tell the old stories and sing the old songs to be as we have always been, the voice of our people eternal. Gather we now to celebrate which was, that which is, and that which will be. Gather we now, as we always have done, untied by the story and bound by love. From Reverend Florence Caplow, the former minister 
with our sibling congregation in Urbana-Champaign. As we kindle this flame, we honor and remember those who have passed into the mystery. Their brightness lives on in our vision. Their courage lives on in our commitments. And their love continues to bless the world through us. It is the collective gifts that make us make it possible for us to be here today. Those offerings of service, of care, of money, those have let come from us from past gifts and they lead in a direct line to our lives in this moment, whether this is the first Sunday you're joining us or whether it's the 21st or 100th and first or the thousandth and first, or if we've been here for generations. We receive those gifts, contribute for our own sake and for that of our children. And what we gather together is passed forward to the people we will never meet. It is good to make an offering when we gather in worship. And we also send a portion of our resources into the world through our Share the Plate program. Half of our undesignated offering goes to a local agency every month. <clears throat> for this month, it is product of the project. They do great work with mentoring and addressing the real-life needs of our young people in our more marginalized populations. Uh, tomorrow, in fact, they have a career event uh, for the Peoria High Schools uh, with panelists on various uh, professional paths. Last week, they filled buses with new voters from the high schools and took them to the election commission to get their first vote in. Yes. As their post on Facebook says, let's remember that our voices matter not just today, but every day. Exercising our right to vote isn't just a responsibility, it's a legacy we leave for the next generation. By voting, we pave the way for our young leaders and ensure they inherit a future shaped by our values, dreams, and collective goals. I think they need, could use a little bit of a boost, don't you? So we include them in our share of the plate, and half of the undesignated collection will go to them this month. This is the last Sunday uh, for that collection for them. Please use the envelopes uh, uh, and indicate where you'd like the your contribution to go or see the QR code in the order of service. And after we have, after the ushers have passed the plates will be our time for reflection and meditation. Um, you're welcome to come forward and light the candles at the tables over to the side. And now, will the ushers please come forward?
from George O'Dell. We need one another when we mourn and would be comforted, when we are in trouble and afraid, when we despair in temptation and need to be recalled to our best selves again. We need one another when we would accomplish some great purpose and cannot do it alone. In the hour of our successes, when we look for someone to share our triumphs, and in the hour of our defeat, when with encouragement we might endure and stand again. We need one another when we come to die and would have gentle hands prepare us for the journey. All our lives we are in need and others are in need of us. This is the time for sharing of joys and sorrows. We offer our care and support to Sarah Allen, who will be spending a significant amount of time with her sister, Susan Eubanks, as Susan goes, undergoes chemotherapy for the next coming months. We wish Susan restored health and strength as she undergoes treatment. We extend healing wishes to the Reverend Mary Moore. Mary is a member of this congregation. We don't see her all that often, but she's connected and feels connected. And Mary suffered a stroke on October 6th. She's one of our elders in Unitarian Universalist ministry, so it's a real challenge to have her like struggle for words after a lifetime of language. She is recovering and is receiving care from her family in Urbana. We send care and support to Donna Dalrymple and her family. Donna's 96-year-old grandma, Clara Bell, was admitted to the hospital. She's being treated for pain and for a mass found in her lung. And Donna asks for prayers for Clara Bell and for the team treating her and for the family as they find a way to come together for Clara Bell's care. We have some notes of sorrow as well. We offer sympathy to Bob and Sherry Dearborn for the death of their beloved cat, Allie. Allie was 20 years old. And it was the time for the end of her life. She was declining. But she was dearly loved. And she already is missed. We also offer a note of condolence to the Franklin family. Just this week, they had the sudden loss of their beloved dog, Georgie. We offer our sympathies for the Franklins and for the loss of their good animal friend. I invite you to join me in holding one more moment, one more moment of quiet to pause, to be present. We enter into this one moment, which is the only one we know we have. And share a moment of quiet together and free.
Amen, shalom, and blessed be. I invite Jesse for the story this morning, the memory tree. Sometimes we have memories that are good and sparkle in our mind's eye and in our heart. Sometimes those memories turn a little sad after the people who are in them aren't here anymore. And sometimes their sparkle becomes even greater. The story we are going to read today There once was a fox who lived with all the other animals in the forest. Fox had lived a long and happy life. But now he was old and he was dying. Very slowly, Fox made his way to his favorite spot in the clearing. He looked at his beloved forest one last time and lay down. Fox closed his eyes. His heart stopped beating. And he was dead. Owl had watched Fox from the top of his tree, and he flew down and landed next to his friend. Owl was very sad. He had known Fox for such a long time. But Owl knew the time had come for his friend to leave. One by one, Fox's friends came into the clearing. First squirrel and weasel, then bear, deer, and bird, and finally, rabbit, mouse, and others came to sit by Fox. Fox had been loved by all. He had been kind and caring, and no one could imagine a life in the forest without him. The animals sat in silence for a long time. Owl was the first to speak. He smiled warmly and said, I remember when Fox and I were young, and every autumn we would race to see who could catch the most leaves. The other animals all remembered and smiled. And Mouse said softly, I remember how much Fox loved the sunset. He always sat on this exact spot. The animals remembered. Many of them had joined Fox, watching the sun go down. It was a happy memory. And their sad hearts filled with warmth. Bear remembered how Fox had looked after her cubs one spring. And Rabbit smiled when she told of how Fox had played tag with her in the tall grass. Squirrel talked about Fox helping him dig up buried nuts one winter. One by one, the animals remembered their favorite stories about Fox. Fox had touched the lives of all the animals in the forest. 
with warmth and kindness. And they all smiled, remembering. While the animals talked, a little orange plant grew out of the snow where Fox was lying. Small and delicate at first, and hardly noticeable, the plant grew bigger and stronger and more beautiful with each story. The animals talked about Fox all through the night. And in the morning, the little plant had grown into a small tree. The animals saw the tree and knew that Fox was still a part of them. During the next days and weeks and months, the animals remembered many more stories about Fox. Their heavy hearts began to feel lighter. And the more and more that they remembered, the more and more the tree grew. Higher and higher and more and more beautiful until it was the tallest tree in the forest. A tree made from memories. A tree full of love. Fox's tree was big and strong enough to shelter all the animals. It was always buzzing with life. The birds built their nests among its trees. Owl raised his grand chicks on the branches. Squirrel found a cozy home in the trunk and bear, deer, and rabbit slept in its shade. The tree gave strength to everyone who had loved Fox. And so, Fox lived on in their hearts forever. I wonder who you carry in your heart. And I wonder how they join us here today. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn number 1002 in the Teal Hymnal, Comfort Me, and we will sing through twice.
Please be seated. In this moment, on this day, we gather in as many, many cultures and faiths to sorrow, to not be alone with what is the deeply subjective experience of grief, of loss, of missing a beloved. This is the time when so many cultures and traditions intersect for this moment. We include the pagan and contemporary pagan experiences um, from the past brought into the present. You know, when the summer harvest is in and the plants are withering and dying back to the earth, we celebrate the cycles of life and death. And at this time, it is believed that the spirits of our ancestors and relatives and pets who have died are very near to us and may want to let us know that they are at peace. The time of year for a particular marking of this is called Samhain, usually around November 1st, following the night of Halloween. That night that the spirit, before the spirits can speak to us. But Samhain is not only for the harvest being blessed, but for everyone can welcome the spirits of their loved ones and their ancestors who are no longer on this earth. We also have this from our universalist line in our tradition as well, coming directly from the Christian tradition with the understanding that all souls, when they die, all souls are ultimately with God and Jesus. All, everyone, that's that universalist piece, right? And each of us, I mean, there's infinite numbers of cultures here, but each of us also, in our own family, in our own neighborhood, uh, in matters of degrees, to honor the grief and the loss and the remembering where we have been. Our approach to death is so deeply local. And it ranges from a full-throated wailing and the rending of clothes to singing to contemplation. And for some of us, we were enculturated to be silenced and not allowed to really express sorrow. We have all of this to swirl amidst us. But I want to spend a moment on grief itself. Now, grief has been studied for ages and across cultures. Because death is universal and impacts our community as well as our personal lives, our family lives. And just recently, I was thinking about yearning, the yearning part of grief. How much we miss someone and want them back how much that feeling can be wrapped up with hope and possibility, how that is part of the grief and the sorrow. Is, oh, I wish. There's a study from 2007 entitled An Empirical Examination of the Stage Theory of Grief. I'm pretty impressed that somebody figured out, was trying to quantify this. But the researchers of this conducted a study of those who lost a close family member. And they were able to measure frequency of certain feelings following a death. Disbelief and yearning, anger, depression, acceptance. Those feelings that have been part of our Western language for the stages of grief for some time. Now the study looked at the deaths that came from natural causes, relatively speaking, so illness and age, which are the causes of most deaths. Not, they didn't look at the ones that were complex or especially violent or from war or similar events. The negative feeling, or the one that was the most 
struggled with feeling of the, the ones that are harder to handle. The one that showed up most frequently was yearning. And that feeling showed up more than they had expected, more than the model had been previously known. So we yearn at a greater level. And I think that actually makes sense. I mean, I wouldn't have been able to measure it, but it makes sense to me how much we want to have that person or that being with us again. That sensation of almost being able to touch them, almost feel them. For some of us, in fact, feel how deeply we yearn, and how that alone brings us to tears. Now, the study was able to show kind of degrees of which yearning and the different feelings kind of showed up or diminished over time. And power to them for figuring out how to measure that. But I'm also going to tell you, as a person and as a minister, that grief might have stages, but it doesn't obey time. It has no sense of calendar or linear anything in my own experience and my understanding of it. That sense of yearning can return any time. I know I've actually been feeling it myself of going through my father's house as we've been trying to take care of his goods during his illness. We find all kinds of family things. We have a room full of all the family things we have gathered, and including this uh, framed, one of the things we hauled across country from Massachusetts was this framed piece created by one of my elder grandmothers or great-grandmothers. And it just reminds me, those pieces, those memories, those family things, remind me of how much I wish they could have been here to see us now. Right? How much The grandmothers or the great-grandmothers or the grandfathers or the uncles or so on could have been here to see my brothers, to see me. So I simply, in this moment, for this year, really want to honor yearning and let that be present among us. And let that be acknowledged. And in that, I'm so grateful that we have such a deep range of practice and culture that inform our ability to feel the feelings with depth, to recognize this experience of loss. And so appreciate the contemporary pagan language and recognition of mortality and that every one of us dies and how we get returned back into the cycle of life. But every phase is its own phase, and that is fine to be acknowledged and recognized. It is so good to remember those who came before us, they are with us still in our memories, in the stuff of our bodies, even when we move and think like some of them, sometimes to our chagrin. It is good to remember our beloved dead, the beings with whom we connected in this life, for the joys shared, for the sorrows endured, and for the lessons and gifts we shared in the course of their proximity. And so today we offer a moment to pause and remember. So I'd like to invite you, invite us in this moment to do so by inviting them to the table set 
among us. If you haven't already done so, you're welcome to bring a photo, a memento, something to the table. And I hope if you've just come in, we have small leaves upon which to write the beloved name, the names of your beloved dead. And you can align, put them on the tables as well. We, will, we can share their names. I can share their names, read them in the course of the service. And if you need help, please do so. We have candles that would be lit. I'd like to invite Regina and Jesse to come forward and help with the candles. Sometimes those are a little hard. And let us just simply pause and savor the presence of those that are with us in spirit. Remember what they taught us. Recall to us the love that surrounds us still and always. And I want to invite Tony up. In addition to writing, we have another act of remembering. Tony, would you come and say something, please? Good morning, everyone. At the recent Haunted Forest event, uh, we had the honor and pleasure of, for the second year, conducting a memorial working uh, that we are calling Ancestor Stones. Uh, it gave the people who were present uh, there an opportunity to pause and reflect on those who had gone before, passed away, uh, who they still carry in their hearts. Um, and a minute to examine the type of relationship that they have with that individual, whether they were still living or the relationship they have with that person's spirit since they had passed. Uh, the working consists of four different colored stones, which are on the table over here, uh, off to the side. Uh, there are solid white stones, frosted stones, blue stones, and clear stones, and each color represents a different relationship. Uh, a solid white stone signifies peace, meaning that your ancestor or the person that you're holding in your heart, uh, all is well between you and their spirit. Their passing is not um, a pain to you. Uh, their memory is one that brings you gladness. A frosted stone is for people who feel that they were left with some unanswered questions, something they wish they could have said, uh, there's certain uncertainty, and they would like a little bit of guidance uh, from that person. Uh, the blue stones represent a need for healing. If their passing uh, still troubles you, if there was no peace uh, at the end of their life, um, and you still feel that you need a little bit of wholeness and healing in that loss. Uh, the clear stones signify an unknown ancestor. For whatever reason, if you were separated from your lineage, uh, you don't know their names, um, and you would like to reconnect, even though you may not have any memories of them, uh, the opportunity is not lost to meet them in prayer and reforge a connection. So for the second year here, we're offering everyone an opportunity to do the same with the stones down here. Uh, there is a sheet at the bottom that has the meanings, uh, and I'll put this one down here as well. Uh, I ask anybody to come down and choose a stone that suits the relationship with the person that they're holding in their heart. Relationships are complicated, so if more than one color stone is suiting for how you feel uh, in your heart, Please choose more than one. Um, and also, uh, ancestors do include more than just people who you have a familial tie to. Uh, there are people in our lives who guide us, uh, inspirations to us, pioneers of our personal callings, um, people who we may never have met, but by the way that they live their lives, set an example that guide us for the positive today. Uh, that would be considered a relational ancestor. Uh, because they are putting forth a path that you still walk today. 
Um, if you're holding those persons in your heart, you may think of them as well while you do this working. If you grab a stone, I ask that you hold on to the stone. And then there is a prayer from my particular tradition uh, that we use, which goes, spirits, beloved spirits, loved ones who have gone before, parted from us, but still with us, connected forevermore. And whatever your intention is, after we say that line, blow your prayer into those stones and deposit it as we're seeing here, deposit in the bowl. What happens with these stones? Last year, uh, we collected from last year's event. It becomes part of a year-long vigil uh, that members of the Keepers of the Great Grove Cups chapter uh, maintain prayers over these stones throughout the year for whatever your intention was. If you uh, have peace with your ancestor, may you continue to have peace. Uh, if you have a question, may you find your answer. If there is a need for healing, may you find the wholeness that you seek. Uh, if there is a connection, if your ancestors are unknown to you, may that connection happen for you. So again, this year, we will collect the stones uh, and we will continue a vigil until next year over what we're collecting. Thank you. We have one more act, if you are so inclined. The sorrow in the world is so great this year. I wanted a way to collect the tears. We have thousands and thousands of people who have died from the war between Israel and Hamas, with Hezbollah, who have died in Africa, and also through the hurricanes that swept through the southeast and the Appalachians. We have people dying because of laws that keep them from health care and try to erase them from existence. And many of us have our own sorrow as well. So if you are so inclined, we have bowls of water and bowls of salt. They are reminiscent of the tears we cry in our losses, in our love, in our grief, and in a way Tears can be a release of pressure. We can often feel better. We hope that through today's tears, we can experience the healing we need. So if you are so inclined, if you'd like to come back up, we have, you're welcome to take a pinch or a spoonful of the salt and let it go into the two bowls of water. Once the salt dissolves, the tears, well, we might not, we, the salt, we might not see it anymore, but it's still with us in some ways, just like we carry our loved ones in our hearts, even when they're not physically present. And I will make the educated guess that many of us weep in this moment for our country. And if that also is with you and heavy in this moment, let us this be a chance to collect that, too. You're welcome to come forward.
Let me offer the names that we are remembering in this moment. And begin with the members who have died in the past year since the previous service of remembrance and those whose memorials were here this year. Lori Russell Chapin, Karen Polster, Pat Cofield, Glenn Zip, Larry Matthews, Heather McMeekin, We held services for Pat Harris's sister-in-law, Shirley McFarland. We honor Shirley Cunningham as she feels the death of her committed friend, Don Paul. We held services for Dan Herzing in June. We also held services for Amanda Franklin's father, Steve Moore, in August. Owen Lindsay, Leslie Dobbins, Dale Dobbins, Steve Stella, Lee Porebski, Ella Burleson, Louis Burleson, Russell Dobbins, Helen Dobbins, Junior Lindsay, Zev Lindsay, Starbuck Lindsay, Fenway Lindsay, Eric King, Sherry Throckmorton, Ron Swan. Mom and Dad, Aunt Rachel, Kenny, Beezer, Bobby, Kimmy, Mom Mitchell, Tara, Joni, Leah, Aunt Janet. Vernon and Glenda Sander, Katrina, Jose Salvador Ordaz, my star man, Samuel Ryan Moya. Billy, mom, dad, we do remember. Loved you then, loved you now. Percy, Riley, 2010 to 2024. Gaylor Fadley, Leon. Bertha and Clarence Farmer. Leon Cote. Betty and Gordon Shaw. Louis Stephen Moore. Georgie, Georgie Franklin, the dog. Robert and Mercedes Humphrey. Eva. For ancestors so far removed in time, names are lost to us. We thank you. We honor your lives. 
Unity Row, Martha Wren Briggs, Elsie Downer, Tom Cooper, Phyllis Cooper, Bernice Arthur, Roberta Elizabeth Benson, 1981 to 2011. For Heather Marie McMeekin, who asked all the questions. We will remember and celebrate her in a couple weeks. Dan. White boy. Ron Ward, Mona Ward, Perseverance. Dorothy Price, David Price, Margot Price. Hazel Price, Leo Price, Lee Price, Virgil Price. Scott, Beloved Father, 1967 to 2015. Chris Owens, Alan Simmons, Donnie Dickerson. We had a lot of trees this time of year. I think about raking leaves with Dad, Bruce Klingle. My Grandma, Catherine Evans. Riley, I miss my great grandmother. She is in our hearts. And Heather McNeekin again, yes. Socorro, Simona, Santiago. Bodie, Dick, and Barbara. and Libby Flint. We honor all those who've been named and all those who are in our hearts, whose names we know and hold close, and the names we don't know, but know we come from them as well. I invite Amanda Franklin forward for our closing poem. This is For All Our Losses by Patricia Sheldon. For those we miss, for things long gone, for those who were what we last held in our arms, in our hands, and in our hearts. We pray. We pray for memories to stay strong, memories of words and warmth, of actions and stillness. We pray for love shared and lived, love to remain with us and with them, for that to become enough. We pray for the courage to put our feet on the floor when we wake, to move through the day as if we cared. The love that holds us all, hold on to me, while I hold on to what I have lost, so may it be. Please rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, There is Love. We'll sing through twice. <laughs>
Good morning. What a wonderful service we've had today. Have I told you lately that I love reading with you on Sundays? Thanks to our minister, Jennifer Innes. Today we're reading Life's Sacred Dance by Joanne Giano. We lit this chalice in honor of life's sacred dance of living and dying. Its flame reminded us of those who have passed to us fragments of holiness. As we leave and as we send this life into the world, may we take a small spark with us. May the spark of this flame remind us that we too are participants in that dance. For those who came before us, we offer gratitude and thanks. May their memories be a blessing. May we be surrounded by their love, as we go forth from this time and place, let us be inspired by their courage, their wisdom, their dreams, and let us honor them by doing the work of living boldly, loving mightily, and creating heaven on earth. Amen and blessed be. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. Mm -hmm. 